I begin my week, which usually for me, for this Sunday, began last Sunday when I left the church. And I always do, I have the same things that I always do, which is I go in prayer to the Lord and I, I ask for direction and guidance, what to present to you, what to bring to you, what it is that I should uh, put myself into for the week. And interestingly enough, I ended up in the book of Malachi. So if you'd open your Bibles to the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. And uh, while you're turning there, I want you to do something for me today. And that is, I want you to listen to what I'm going to say with maturity. I can't believe I just said that. See, every message I've heard preached out of the book of Malachi has always been on one thing. Prove me now herewith. It's always been the same thing. I've seldom, if ever, I think, and I've heard, unfortunately, I've heard a lot of messages uh, from diverse places. I've never heard anyone treat the book of Malachi with proper care as to really examine if we're allowed to take that one passage, prove me now here with, and club God over the head with it. So I think you already will probably know where I'm going, but I'm going to try and lead you down the path. This may not happen all in one message, so don't fault me. God just put a lot of stuff on my heart to tell you, and if it ends up being more, uh, we'll deal with it at another time. Now, Malachi becomes hugely important for me in the understanding of Malachi, I guess because it is so contemporary, it is so representational of the church today that it's almost frightening. Now, I know plenty of people who will take the background and distort it just to give a little framework. Because of the nature of this book, we are certain of a few things. We are certain that this book was written in the post-exilic period. That means that all the people who could return and did return from being carried away in captivity did. That the work of Ezra and Nehemiah of rebuilding the temple was complete. That the prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah had already been given to stir up the people. And this being the last book of prophecy, last book of the Hebrew canon, speaks volumes that in such a short period of time after the return of the people from exile and the rebuilding and restored worship in the temple, that apostasy has already occurred in such a short period of time. We're speaking of probably less than a hundred years and the dates around Malachi prove to be extremely, dating the book is very difficult, but I will say this, factually, without a doubt, all of this occurred after the temple and worship had been restored. So it almost leaves you shuddering to think that the people who had been carried away in captivity, who had come back because of the call of Cyrus letting the people return, it almost should make us shudder that in such a short period of time, People forgot the honor and the privilege to come into the Lord's house and hear and worship and offer their offerings. So this book, the background of this book for me is extremely important. Um, Malachi, whose name means my messenger, and a lot of people have debated if, it's, if Malachi is my messenger, the messenger of the Lord, or a proper name, Frankly, I don't care, and I say not because I don't care, but because when I begin this, the one thing that I do care about is it says, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel, by the, literally by the hand of Malachi, my messenger. And I'm going to tell you today that the burden of the Lord, the burden of the word of the Lord, is what has been placed on my heart. You know, I hear people all the time saying, the Lord has burdened me with this. No, you're never going to have an independent burden. If you have the mind of Christ, this, the very things that were important to God are going to be important to you, if, if that is your burden. This was 
the burden of this man. And this four chapters in the King James, three in the Masoretic text, is a book preeminently, believe it or not, although it doesn't appear to be, it's a book preeminently of God's love. And I've heard many folks talk about the book of Hosea and say, well, this is a book of God's love. Perhaps this may be even more. Because you have to remember now, at the, this is the last canonized book, the close of the prophetic voice, canonized prophetic voice, until 400 years later when we hear John the Baptist declaring, Behold the Lamb of God, which he was spoken of, by the way, by the prophet Malachi as well. So it's rather interesting for this setup that the tragic last book of the Bible is, it's almost like God's last word to his people in love, in long suffering, to try and get them back on track. Seven times in this book, seven times, you'll read in your King James, it appears for the most part the words, wherein, a question is asked. And then, wherein? The people reply. Every single question that is asked, and we'll say by the mouth of the prophet, but undoubtedly it is God speaking through the prophet, every single one of these seven questions should have driven the hearers to repentance, to a right attitude. Instead, it showed their stout-heartedness, their unbreakable spirit, of rebellion. Now, you might say, wow, what a way to start a message. A unique style of rhetorical questions, maybe, perhaps, and then this polemical uh, realm, which we're going to look at. But I want us just to see why I said it's preeminently a book of love, because it shows a side of God's love that most people don't preach. Most people want to preach about their version of God's love, which is ooey, gooey, sticky, and oozy. This is God's love saying, hey, listen, you bunch of mess-ups. I'm still God. I haven't changed. I'm trying to get you to turn around if you listen to me one last time. That was the Scott version, by the way. <laughs> this little book, four chapters, contains 55 verses. 22 times we have, saith the Lord of hosts. So you can really get a perspective that out of the 55 verses, it's pretty close to half of the verses contain a reference to, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Very important. It's full of a declaration of what God was saying to his people and still speaks to us today. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And here's the first word. I've loved you. And I would point out, if you'll please put in your margin, this is not I've loved you, period, like I, I've loved you and I don't love you anymore, like a bad country song. <laughs> loved you, but I don't love you no more. No. <laughs> this is God saying, and I'm, I think you, I would bore you with the Hebrew, but I don't need to. There's so many good things in this book. God is saying, I have loved you, and the Hebrew says, and still do, the essential meaning. I still love you. And here is the first reply to God's declaration of love. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? God is put on uh, the pressure point with each one of these questions to be on the defensive and defend himself. And the first thing that is said here, wherein, how, how? How have you loved us, God? Now, just that at the starting point, if we were to, I'm, I may not get to where I'm going, so bear with me. Just that at the starting point is pretty shocking. God says, I've loved you, and I still do. How, God? How could you say you love us? T tell us. Tell us how. It sounds like a bad old marriage, doesn't it? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob. I hated Esau, and I know pe much, there's much debate about how could God say he loved Jacob and hated Esau. And I would say to you, put on the spectacles of the whole Bible and understand that God chose Jacob. When we get to the New Testament, you'll hear that word 
hate out of the mouth of Jesus, declaring if you're not willing to hate mother, father, sister, wife, that is to prefer something above God. So God is saying he preferred this chosen vessel, Jacob, even though he didn't look like a chosen vessel and didn't act like a chosen vessel, preferred him over Esau, who was a profane person who did not discern the things of God, laid his mountains and his heritage to waste for the dragons, the, the jackals of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, Edom is the same, uh, you'll see Esau, Edom, Seir, the same personages being spoken of, the same land. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, we're crushed, but we will return and build the desolate place. We'll, we'll come back and rebuild again. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build. And God says, but I will throw down, I'll demolish it. They shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Now, I want you to catch this picture. Because it's real easy to miss when you're reading and flying through this small book. Right out the gate, God, when he is questioned about well, how have you loved us, he juxtaposes Jacob and Esau, and he juxtaposes the land of Edom, that land of Esau, with Israel. Edom destroyed. Let's travel through the mind of these people who would have at least known some history. We know the history of Jacob. We know the book of Genesis lays out a clear pattern. Well, let's, go right, let's go right to the beginning, right in the womb, right in Rebekah's womb. Two nations are in there, and God says before they even come out the gate, who's going to serve who? Declares it. These two nations... And God goes to tell how these two nations will be and what manner they'll be. And if we follow the pattern, we know that out of Jacob, basically Jacob births a whole nation. That'll settle in a little while. One passage where it says, and then they beget so, and then they beget another one, and then they beget another one, and then they beget another one. Mommy, what's begetting? <laughs> Never mind. They just did a lot of begetting in those days. <laughs> but if you follow that whole history, the promise that was given to Abraham, that was carried through to Isaac, that was carried through the, to Jacob, that then these people are now in Egypt because of Joseph being incarcerated and now ruler in Egypt. Now the whole lot of the family is now in Egypt. And we know at the death of Joseph, a pharaoh was risen up who knew not Joseph and the people came under the bondage that was spoken of to Abraham. When, when it was declared to Abraham, your people will go in and four generations later they will come out richer than when they went in. This was all spoken of by God and foretold. So we know the lot of Joseph, I mean of Jacob rather, we know that God chose this line. We don't hear too much about Esau. We know that Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. He didn't have respect for the things of God. We know much about that whole picture of the two brothers, but then after Jacob flees, we don't hear too much about Esau anymore. And while Israel, the whole nation, Jacob's uh, descendants are in Egypt, it says of Esau's descendants, the Edomites, they were rulers and kings in their own realm. They had already established uh, a hierarchy, if you will, with a rule. And so you can begin to see much is told about Jacob, very little about Esau, except that as you move through the Old Testament, you find that the land of Edom, sometimes called Sair, sometimes referenced by other names, that particular land was seized by David. And a little bit later, Amaziah seizes the territory of Sair, taking the, the capital city, Sila. So not much is said except for the fact that the prophets Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Obadiah, they all prophesy, by the way, uh, even Joel prophesies of the wiping out and the desolation of Edom. 
So just in this small little framework, when God says, I have loved you and still do, it should have woke, the, the eyes should have been opened immediately to the fact, hey, wait a minute, God really does love us. Look at how he's preserved us. Look at how he's cared for us, even when we were carried away in captivity because we forsook our worship to him. We were carried away in captivity, brought back by the grace of God, preserved. God, the response should have been, wow, God, God really does love us, and he still loves us. So immediately there is a juxtaposing of the two uh, brothers, Jacob and Esau, and God is using this tool to say, I chose you, Jacob. Now you who are listening, the remnant, you are chosen. And the juxtaposing between the two nations, Israel and Edom. You see, it says here, they'll come back, Edom will come back and say, we're crushed, we'll return, we'll build a desolate, we'll rebuild. And God says no. And the declaration of God saying no has stood to this day. No. If you follow the last ruler of the Babylonian Empire, Nabonidus, after he conquers for a time that whole area, and then it suffers just one after another, the territory being seized by nomadic wanderers. It never becomes a great territory. It never really becomes anything again. Fulfilling what God said versus your eyes shall see, and you shall say the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Two manners to display God's love to his people. Now, if you want to know what a burden of, of the word of the Lord is, can you imagine going to a people and trying to tell them and convey this? And it is a burden. Not, oh, I hate this, and it's heavy, and it's terrible. It's a burden to try and tell people even today, you know, God loves you. He still loves you after the 13th and 25th and millionth mess up, it's very hard. It is a burden to keep conveying the same message to people. And if that is what the Lord places on our hearts, which I believe he's placed on mine, this particular burden, the same thing, to let people know God has shown us by diverse ways that he still loves us. Now, you might be like some of these people and say, well, how, how could God possibly love me? Look at, look at all the things I'm going through. Careful now. The next thing we're going to see, so the first, first place is the declaration of God's love for his people. And then the second thing, I want you to look at verse 6. A son honoreth his father, a servant his master. If then I be a, a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. And you say, Wherein have we despised your name? Now, this is kind of crafty, where we're being led here. Each one of these indictments is to say, God says, I love you, but the people put God on trial and say, prove it, God, show us. We don't believe it. Now, here we are again. God's being depicted as a father, and even in the natural, we're told, even just by the mere commandments at the beginning, to honor our father, and just in the mere carnal realm, a slave would honor and fear and, and have reverence for his master. And God says, I'm supposedly this, and you can't even muster up fear and reverence for me? And they say, wherein have we despised your name? Well... You, pollute, you offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? There is not a possibility today, friends, I'm telling you, of reading this book and concluding that the sum total of this book should begin with God. God puts up with a lot of stuff. I mean, thank God we serve a God the, just the way he is, because this tells me, I mean, and I've said this before, if I was God, I'd just zap a finger and zzz, it's, <laughs> Wipe them off the map. Well, how, how can you say you love us? And how can you say that we've despised your name? And how can you say that we've polluted you? Now, here come, and this is a pretty severe indictment against the people. And you might say, well, how does this apply to me today? And I'm, I'll get to it. See, this whole book, the whole book, 
talks about giving, not just the passage of Malachi 3.10. The whole book is giving to God how he sees what we do. And I said, it's a modern message. I don't care what anybody wants to say. This is the most modern message you're going to get out of the Old Testament here. Ye offer the blind for sacrifice. Is it not evil? If you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to your governor. Will he be pleased with it? Now, let me just put a footnote here. Why I said this is definitely after the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the last civil governor among the people. And it's pretty clear that perhaps Malachi, I'm sorry, Nehemiah may have still been alive at this time and may have returned to give an accounting of some type to another land. We can deduce that out of some of the chapters out of Nehemiah's book. So there was a civil governor. God is saying, try offering your garbage to a mere human. Try passing off your bad sacrifices, your bad offerings, the things that were crippled, that were lame. That were... Try and pass them off to the governor and see if he'll accept them. If he accepts them and he thinks they're good, what I'm saying here is what, is what is being said. Try passing off your garbage offering to some human ruler, to some civil uh, uh, personage here, and see if they accept it. And now I pray you beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. Will he regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. God is saying, stop these pointless offerings. Huh? Are you saying God told the people to stop giving their offerings? Yes. And that's why I've said to you, and I've repeated myself so often, I don't want to teach people about tithing as the first method of instructing people on giving. Jesus, we know, came for a specific purpose. The Apostle Paul talks about that purpose, and he says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Though rich, he became poor. He, he emptied himself of heaven's glory to take on a tent of human flesh to come and save us. And most of giving today doesn't spend any time talking about the reality of the gift, it focuses on the receptacle, me. What am I going to get? I've said to you, until you're taught about giving with the heart and why you should give from the heart, you, you begin, the beginning point. People say, well, I, I'm a Christian. Well, the barometer of your spirituality, friends, is going to be by the way you give, not because you try and, and exemplify what giving looks like, but because the Spirit of Christ lives in you, the greatest giver of all times, living in you, and will make you a giver. I don't have to come up with the gimmicks to tell you why you ought to. I can declare what the Bible says, but I know for a factual basis that when God comes in and takes up residence in here, something marvelous happens. You find yourself doing things you never would have done otherwise, because of the gift that's placed in you. So when people talk about, will you say God doesn't want the offerings of the people? That's right. In fact, Malachi is not the only person to say it. Isaiah back there said, stop the offerings. God doesn't want them because there was just this road performance. I'm telling you what I see going on in much of Christendom today. I see lots of people trying to coerce the people. Come on now, give it your best. Come on, empty those pockets. Come on now. Uh, they give you a dollar amount. Here's what you're going to give today to the Lord. That, I almost felt that was for real for a minute there. <laughs> the problem with all that, why does God need a gimmick? Why does God need my garbage? Because that's the way a lot of people give. You see, when I said this is a modern message, a lot of people give to the church, and please don't raise your hand. You know, I've heard folks say, oh, you know, we got this really dilapidated table over there in the garage, and uh, uh, Goodwill won't even come get it. They don't even want it. We'll give it to the church. 
they always need stuff. You know, it's got one leg, it's in the corner, it's, it's barely standing up, it teeters like this. We'll give it to the church. They could use a table. For what? Firewood? Yeah. But that's the mindset of giving today. Give God your garbage. No, listen. Uh, I remember the years when the Salvation Army trucks would drive up and down the streets. They'd come and, you know, they'd have the bell and people would come and, you know, most of the stuff people would give would be like, oh, well, I can't get rid of our garbage. The garbage man is coming. Salvation Army is coming. You know, bring the garbage out. Not to God. And that's the whole point of this book. Preeminently through this whole book, God is talking about the manner and method of giving God's way. Now, only God sees the heart. When I say, give with your heart, only God knows where your heart is. I, I, I don't. And I've talked to you about the great physician. He does the open heart surgery. He can, he can take a hard heart. He can cut back the skin. When we speak of where it says, circumcise your hearts, he does that. Brings forth the tenderness and the newness of life and the ability to rejoice in the gifts that he's given to be able to share and then the reality sinks in. If that is the true epitome of the Christian experience, excuse me, can I just be colloquial? Why the hell are there people out there making all these ideas about why you should or why you have to or the, the, the ideology behind giving? If it is something that has happened within you, which is not natural, then it goes without saying that your giving is not going to be natural either, which means not by man's means. So when I look at this, I think this is a modern message for today. And then right after this point is made, some great declaration of hope for the future comes right here. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, a prophecy of hope. And let me just emphasize this. I want to underscore something. My name will be great among the Gentiles. And look at the, the two things that are mentioned immediately, immediately after God's name being great. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name. We know that translates into our modern day practical application of prayers going up to God, the incense of prayers going up to God, and a pure offering. See, God has always said the same thing the same way. And he always had in mind a people that would respond, not because there was some carrot at the end of the stick, but because the response mechanism has been placed in you and in me. I love this prophecy because it talks of a future time, and it tells two things, the incense, the prayer of the people, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. You know, these people, they don't care enough. They don't, they've rejected me. And now I'll go to these people over here, which we know comes to fruition, the beginning of which, as Christ came in the flesh. But ye have profaned it, that ye say the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat is contemptible. He said, also, behold, what a weariness, what a burden this is. Just giving to God stuff, what a burden this is. Now, I'm, I may pick off a couple of churches and uh, people as I go here, but there are some folk who think serving God is a burden. Let me tell you something. If that's your attitude, I pray that, I'll turn my back, I pray that God turns you on your head right now, all right? <laughs> all right. Wow, nobody has that attitude. Thank God. Okay, good. If you think that serving God is a burden like these people, just wait until you find out what type of a burden awaits for that type of attitude. You have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. You have brought that which was torn. He's going to repeat it again. Torn, lame, and sick. In fact, the Hebrew rendering of torn actually means stolen. So it's entirely possible that they were not only offering lame and sick things, but they were also offering things that were stolen to God. Interesting. 
Thus you brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand? Should I take this of you? But cursed be the deceiver, the cheater, which hath in his flock a male, and voweth to sacrifice it unto the Lord. And instead of doing that, at the very last, with a perfect specimen to be offered according to the prescribed offerings, at the last minute, they swap it out, they put the thing that's crippled in there, and keep the best for them. Now you begin to see the whole mindset of giving is lined up here. Um, God says, For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful, is to be feared among the, among the heathen. You get the idea that there's a setup coming here, and there is. We first deal with God's love to his people, how he has preferred Jacob, how he's protected the line of Jacob. We come down a little bit further and we see how these people have despised God's name and his altar. And the altar was always a place of sacrifice. And if you think back to the first altars that were built, they were always built. And there we have, and Noah offered an offering. And Abraham offered an offering. And Jacob offered an offering. And none of these were coerced. None of these were for the law's sake. There was no law then. And much of it was just a burnt offering, completely presented to God and wholly consumed for him, for his purpose. So when people read this passage, it should become clear that God's saying, I have a method with man. Now, as for the Old Testament and the Old Dispensation, offerings were prescribed. The book of Leviticus lays out the offerings. But these people are now going through the motions. That's why I said it's a timely book. They're going through the motions of being religious. I know a lot of folks like that. They go to church, sit in church, act religious, they even have perfected the art of Christianese and speaking religious, saying things that, I don't know, when God hears them what he's thinking. I'll leave that alone, because I, if I go off on that, you, you may never get me back. <laughs> but here comes an admonition to speak to the hearts of the priests. And now, ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to your heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse. You say, well, how could God say that he loves these people? Because the book started out that way, as the burden of the word of the Lord. How could you say that he loves these people? And he says, if you don't get your heart right, I'm going to curse you. Well, Sometimes God has to do what he has to do to get people's attention. I'm sure here he was really ready to do it. In fact, later on we're going to read where it says, you're already cursed because they just would not listen and respond. You know, half of Christianity would do really well to study progressive education, the, the uh, application of it in America. Half of the, the body of Christ, if we could get some people who'd say, yes, I'll, I'll discipline myself to read about John Dewey, would recognize that the bulk of Christianity today has been influenced and deteriorated, has been broken down by what is in it for me. Now, these people didn't have John Dewey's mindset. Uh, they didn't have his, his uh, ideology, but they had his mindset. What is, what is God going to do for me? And the modern mind can't look at this and say, wait a minute, God is still telling them to get their hearts right to get back to the reality. Now, we've juxtaposed Jacob and Esau. We're going to have another, uh, and we have Edom and Israel. We're going to have another one right here. He, in chapter 2, he's going to compare the priests of Malachi's day to the Levites. And that's a scary comparison because uh, God has forgotten a little bit of the, the uh, we'll call them the missteps of the tribe, so only good is spoken of right here. My covenant was with him of life and peace. I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. He revered my name. Speaking of the Levites, the law of truth, the Torah of Emet, the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge. They should uh, seek the law at his mouth. And then he says the crowning indictment to the people, but you are departed out of the way. So he still called them back 
Here to your hearts. I want you to give glory to my name, but you've departed out of the way. And he juxtaposes the priests of Malachi's day with the Levites. And it gets worse. The indictments are going to get worse here. You think, well, how are we going to apply this? We're going to, eventually, we're going to get to the giving part of this message, which I've just spent the last 20 or 30 minutes on, by the way, telling you about what matters to God. If you're going to come and bring him your garbage, he says, try that on somebody else. If you're going to try and think that you can mock God by swapping out and not giving God your best, and the whole sum total of this is not to be construed as, well, this is legalism and this is the law. No. In fact, the whole principle that God is going to lay out here, way back there in Deuteronomy, he said something so remarkably profound, I don't think any of these people heard it. He said, that land of inheritance that I'm going to let you live in, you're going to be aliens and you're going to be my tenants in the land. They never truly even possessed the land per se, because he said, the land, my friends, is me, God speaking, mine. I'm going to give you the power, Deuteronomy 8, to get wealth. Don't say, you won't come and say, my hand did this. I'm going to give you the power to prosper. I'm going to do all these things, but it's God speaking. God saying, but I did this for you. Now, come back to reality for a minute, and you'll see how foolish when people say, mine, my things, well, we don't live in that society like they did. Uh, people had land and they had cattle, but everything that they had was a byproduct of God giving them the land to prosper in, the rain from heaven, the sun in the sky, the ability to reproduce. So we translate that today, and unfortunately people say, well, yeah, but my, my things are still my things, you know, because... <laughs> All right. So then, here's an interesting thing. I'm moving on in the, in the book. We have an interesting passage which always gets um, kind of messed up. People like to talk about this passage from verses uh, 10 to 16 and say, God hates divorce. And I've heard every type of silliness preached out of these passages. And what, what is being said here in these few verses? Um, that people are not living up to the covenant Brother against brother, they're dealing treacherously against themselves, dealing treacherously against God. And then we go down to the real root of the matter. They were disobeying God, so they took foreign women. And the possibility for these women to persuade the men to worship other gods, which we know that's the whole history of the children of Israel in their wandering ways, going off and serving other gods. And their form of worship. This one verse caught my eye and I said, you know, I've been telling you this as a congregation. Now I feel like I just read it to you and say, see, I told you. All right? There's something delicious about this. In verse 13, basically God's saying, I have another thing against you. You're covering the altar of the Lord with tears and with weeping and crying out insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore or receive it with goodwill at your hand. What was happening here, those weren't tears of repentance at the altar. That was just a bunch of hoi polloi, emotional, oh God, help me, but it wasn't a crying out from the heart. And God says, you know this, this silly stuff you're doing at my altar, all this activity of crying, the crocodile tears, the cry me a river, cry me a river. Crime, yeah, that is God's song. But the reality here is, he says, I have this against you. I can't stand these the crocodile tears and the weeping and all the fake stuff you're doing at my altar. Because see, God who knows the heart would know whether or not it's real. And he says, stop it. See, this whole book, I said, is so delicious because it indicts not only the people of Malachi's day, it indicts most of the church world today because we have this, I've got to keep God on trial. He'll prove to me that he loves me by showing me that he's going to grant me favor my way and bless my carnality. Uh, I'm going to keep God on trial by keep bringing him my garbage, my broken tables and all the stuff that no one wants to even steal from me, and I'll call it an offering. 
And now we have the last of the insults here, this fake repentance. You know what I really believe? I'm going to tell you. I really believe that God has put something so incredible from all of these books that I've been sharing with you, from the messages of Hosea and Jonah and Malachi. There is a call going out. It's not Melissa Scott making the call. It's God making the call, telling people to turn back for real, to start back to your prayer life, to start back to your relationship with Him. I'm not your intermediary, and I'm certainly not the person uh, trying to push you into it. I believe God is calling His people to a better, closer relationship. He's calling them back. All of these messages have lined up the same way, as if to say, however you hear this, however it's received, God is still calling the people back the same way. And staggeringly, if you keep reading this book, you discover nestled in here another, I can't believe they're going to say this moment, you have wearied the Lord with your words. You've, you've made God tired with all of your professing down here. And they say, where have we wearied him? How? How could we weary the Lord? We precious people of the earth, we chosen wonderful children, how could we weary the Lord? You ever meet people who just think they're so special? <laughs> like that. When you say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. You know, we've all done that. We've all at some point, we've been like Habakkuk and said, God, how can you be blessing those people over there? They're corruptors, they're thieves. They're, how could you be doing that? I've got to tell you something. The Lord's been dealing with me a lot on this very subject because I've, for a long time and saying, Lord, how could you bless that activity? Or how could you bless those people? First of all, that's God's business. But you ever heard of making a deal with the devil? Because a lot of folks do that too. They'll sell their soul for whatever it is they think they can get in order to prosper in the here and now. You ever see the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The guy at the crossroads? Great musician, huh? Yeah, exactly. If you haven't seen the movie, you'll... Forget about that reference, it doesn't matter. But some folks will say, well, God now must be prospering that because God is endorsing everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. They had a bad view of God's justice. And he delighteth in them. Oh, these people here who are uh, resting the scriptures, who are deceiving the saints, who are leading people, God must delight in them. God is saying, you fool. This is why well, I said to you, this is what's wrong with the church. People are afraid to stand on the word of Jesus Christ. People are afraid to say nothing but. I don't need the add-ons. I just need this word, rightly divided, to stand on with a sure foundation. Let all the other people go in the ditch. Jesus does say, let the blind lead the blind, and if they fall in a ditch, leave them there. Go on about your business. That's why I love Jesus. <laughs> he delighteth in them. Or where is the God of justice? It says of judgment. But is God going to correct these wrongs? Hey, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. I've, this is the one reality check here. God may not correct the wrongs in the now, but you can guarantee when the flames of hell are singeing and forever burning, that's when God gets to correct you know, and it's, it's correction that lasts forever. It's an eternal correction. So, you know, what would you rather have? Somebody get a little slap on the wrist right now or correction forever? Yeah, that's what I said. So it doesn't bother me. It shouldn't have bothered you. It shouldn't have bothered these people. But they had a wrong idea of who God was. And immediately following this, amazing prophecy, uh, chapter 3, from verses 1 through 5 is a prophecy of the coming of Christ. The forerunner is the announcement by John the Baptist announcing the coming of Christ who will come into his temple and the telling of how God is, the Lord Jesus, will be 
the purifier, how the Lord Jesus will be the vindicator. And all of this is lined up, woven right in the middle, and then immediately following that prophecy, you get to God saying, for I am the Lord and I change not. Therefore, your sons of Jacob are not consumed. I mentioned Jacob again. Why? Second time now. See, the comparison is still going. God is saying, I'm long-suffering. I've got this plan of redemption that will come. It will come to pass. But yet, you still, you still put me on trial. You, so you say, how have we done this? And how, do, how could you say that, God? You know, not one of these responses says, oh, Lord, I see it. We have sinned. You know, it's the toughest thing to explain to people, especially some of you new people that come to the church. God hates excuses, and so do I. And I try not to give them. When I've gotten my tail busted for whatever it is, just God hates excuses. This must have just absolutely frayed the fact that here he is, long-suffering, and they, not one of these indictments, not one of them produces a repentant attitude. Oh. Don't ask me if I want that job. <laughs> I told you Jonah had good results. He went into the great city of Nineveh, and his message was, God's going to destroy it in 40 days, and he left. <laughs> good preaching. They must have believed him because they all repented. Lord, give me a message like that, all right? <laughs> but God says, For I am the Lord, and I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. And tells them from the history of their fathers how they went away from the ordinances. Now, I want you to circle this word right here, return. Return unto me. Oh, here she goes with her grammar bit here, but it's a quick one, trust me. Return which we've said many times, the Hebrew word, shub, and right here, it is an imperative. Love it. God's saying, okay, had enough of being nice and listening to your stuff now. I'm telling you what to do. Now, ironically, there are three imperatives that are going to come out of this. And ironically, we know the end and the sum total. People didn't change their ways. But God says, return unto me, and I'll return unto you. Now, that may sound strange, but listen to what they say. How shall we return? <laughs> now, they're not asking for directions. They're saying, what are you talking about, God? We're in the synagogue. We're the church. What are you talking about, return? We're already here. Look at us. This place right here is where it gets difficult for me. Because I said this was a modern message. So many people hear the word, return, and repent. And that is not for you to flagellate yourself and to uh, walk around groveling on your knees and making strange trips to foreign lands. That's where you and God, you become Jacob before God. You and God, not wrestling it out all night, you and God, where you tell God, I'm Jacob. You talk to him, and you tell, he already knows. And that's when God says, Israel. A genuine turning, this is not some cutesy little word, I'll just turn around. I spoke last week on that word in the Greek where sheep... Sheep need something or someone to turn them in the, in the right direction. God's saying the same thing here, but with force in an imperative directive. I've heard all your excuses now. I'm tired of listening. I'm telling you what to do. To be that bold, and forgive me, but to be that bold and see the, the pacifiers that are put in people's mouths in the name of Jesus, 
rather than saying, friends, I don't need to have gimmicks or scare tactics. I just need God's word, and God's word has the power to go right to the heart, to be released, and to get you and me back praying, fasting, reading his word, giving him what he requires, not because he mandates it, but because we joyfully do it with the right attitude. So here, the first imperative, return unto me and I'll return unto you. How? Where we haven't departed anywhere. Now I want you to see the next question. There's no, there's no pathway. There's just another question. Will a man rob God? Yet, and I want you to change this in your Bibles. It says, yet you have robbed me. No, yet you are robbing me. The Hebrew is an active participle that says they were continuing to do so on a regular basis. And you know what? If we're, if we're just a little bit honest, we rob God all the time. I'm, I'm speaking for me, and I'm going to say it for you and anyone who doesn't acknowledge this. I can't help you. We rob God all the time. See, this isn't just about... He says, where and if, where? they say, where and if have we robbed you? And God says, in tithes and offerings. But if you look at what the tithes and offerings represent, tithes and offerings represented the portion that belongs to the Lord. God said, you put me first, and I'll bless the rest. And I've heard people say, well, don't preach that message, because that's legalism. Well, then park the money for a minute and begin with yourself. Are you putting God first in your life? Is God preeminently getting the best part of your day? And don't come back and say, I'm not robbing God. You know, I, I hear people say all kinds of things about, what well, they were just talking about tithes and offerings. It was a mindset. The reason why they were robbing God, don't stop at the tangible but God used the tangible because it was the only thing that he could get them to see. You're touching this. You're retaining which is mine. You're not giving me what I asked you to. Why? Because putting God first, go back to the tithe or the offerings above, was a constant reminder of God's preeminence in the person's life. Well, Pastor, I just don't like the tithe. Well, neither do I. And tell you why. Because a person who's truly been touched and born again wants to give everything away. It's the mindset of the first church. It's the mindset when, when Paul said, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Jesus was not thinking about, you know, the, the next, whatever it is, material-wise. In fact, Jesus, I hate to say this because this makes people mad. People don't like this. Jesus did not preach temporal riches. He's, riches, he didn't speak against them and say, well, you can't have money. But he said, you can't serve God and mammon, knowing our hearts that we are slaves. And we are slaves. The curse of Adam to go out and work with spread on, sweat on your brow forces you into the slavery of having to be slave in the world. You need money to get by. Please don't tell me otherwise. So, Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, how? Well, how have we robbed you? Now, follow this thinking. This, is, this would be like America's dumbest criminals right here. <laughs> but this is like the Bible ones. Because God's looking down. He's saying, wait a minute. I just chronicled that the offerings that you're supposed to be bringing me to my altar for the transgressions and sins of the people. Remember, that's what the offerings represented. Sin offerings, burnt offerings, peace offerings, those offerings that were to cleanse the person of guilt, of sins, the sins known and unknown. We list the whole thing as in Leviticus, if you want to read it, which were designed. Remember what happened when the, the offerings were brought, the priest would lay hands on, and they would, the, the offerer would lay hands on and basically commit their sins to that animal that was then sacrificed. Think about the robbery there to bring a blemished vehicle, whatever they were offering, 
to transmit their sins to which God said, I won't accept anyway, robbing them, robbing God of that, robbing God of his praise, robbing God of worship. Let's keep going. How have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? Now, I said I asked for maturity because it takes a mature mind to deal with this whole book. Why I'm doing this big, giant, covering almost the whole book is because I don't want people ever to reach into this book and play like God is a slot machine. God has some prerequisites that come before this prove me now herewith. He starts first by saying, I'm God and I change not. Imperatively, turn back to me. He's no longer saying, please, I plead with you. Please remember me. Forget not the Lord thy God which led thee out of Egypt, out of the house of God. No more of that. Done being Mr. Nice Guy here. He says, return imperatively. And he says, you're cursed with a curse. For, the, for you have been robbing me. Again, another active participle on a continuous, continuous, continual basis. They have been robbing me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. Now be careful, because I tread on this very, very carefully, where people would say, well, so you mean to tell me the tithing principle is I put God to the test? Well, the, word for, the Hebrew word for prove is a testing word. It's also to inspect. It's to scrutinize. There's a more profound meaning going on behind here. Let me just say, first of all, the first imperative, return. The second imperative, bring. God doesn't say, now, if you'd like to. He makes it an imperative now, and he's saying, bring. Return to me and bring. Oh, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Well, let's, let's see what's really going on here. He says, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows, plural, of the Hebrew reads of the heavens, and pour you out a blessing, and you see all the italics there, that, sh that shall, there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now, that's only one part of a promise, but let me start right there. The windows of heaven. If some of you are going to leave here, and you're just going to hate me, and that's okay. For Christ's sake, that's okay. If the windows of heaven, if God needs the windows of heaven to dispense, hear me out, if God needs the windows of heaven to dispense the tangible, you and I have a big problem. So what do you mean, Pastor? Well, start, go back a little bit to what this really means. It means God is calling the people back to a right worship with a right heart. Before they can even do anything, he's saying, this inside, the heart must be right. And then after the heart is right, he says, bring. And now let's look at this. He's calling for what belongs to him. And he's saying, let's look at this, open the windows of heaven. Now I read that and I said, where have I read that before in the Bible, the windows of heaven? Then it dawned on me, the windows of heaven, Genesis 7, 11, the windows of heaven. When it says, and after Noah had built the ark and did exactly what the Lord said in building the ark and went inside, he and his family and all the creatures that God said clean or, uh, and unclean in the ark, it says the fountains of the deep broke open and the windows of heaven opened and it began to rain and the earth began to be flooded and the windows of heaven opening were for the people in the ark a blessing and the people outside of the ark a curse and judgment. And I began to think the windows of heaven, the windows of heaven here obviously have the same frame of reference. It's obedience to God. God says, if you will turn back to me and be obedient to me, and it's not a promise of a slot machine, but that God will hasten his word. God will make his word come to pass. Now, I, 
I was reading and I thought, wait a minute, I've read this somewhere else, the windows of heaven. Well, surely the windows of heaven with Elisha, where we know there's a great famine in the land. And one of the dignitaries sitting there at the gate says, only the windows of heaven, basically, because Elisha says there'll be food. And this personage says, only if the windows of heaven could be open. And I guess he said it in chiding. Elisha said, yeah, it's going to happen. Your eyes will see it, but you won't get to eat any of it. And he was making a prophecy that the guy was going to be wiped out of the gate just after he saw it happen. And surely it came to pass. The uh, camp of the enemy is completely abandoned, and all their food and belongings are there. And they seize all the food and all the belongings. And of course, this was deemed as the windows of heaven being opened up to clear the way for people to have food in the middle of a famine. So I thought, you know, wait a minute. God is saying the same thing here, like he said to Noah, like he said to Elisha. I gave my word of promise to you, and it will not return void. But don't think that you're going to come in here and stride in and say, now prove me now here with God. I'm going to put you on trial. The whole book of Malachi is the people putting God on trial. The whole thing, God turns around and says, okay, you want to put me on trial? Because you've been doing that now for the last three and a half chapters, for the last hundred or thousands of years. Want to try it now? Let's see what happens when you turn back to me. Bring me what's mine. Let's see what type of blessings come out. And let me see the right translation here of this. And I didn't bring it out, but I did write it somewhere. The right translation of this, you won't have enough to contain. There won't be enough room. Here, I wrote it out because I wasn't sure that I would be able to say it as succinctly. God promises to empty the heavens with blessings until his supply is depleted. When will that happen? <laughs> See, when you say, he'll pour out a blessing, people always read this, pour you out a blessing, there shall not be room enough to contain it or receive it. Well, the better way to read this is God's promises to empty the heavens with blessings until his supply is depleted, which will never be. His supply will never be depleted. The problem is our faith and our obedience to him can be decreased or wiped out. And God sees this. this. This promise is staggering. But let me just say one thing. I brought this because it was so delicious. I, I seldom read commentaries to you, but uh, this is the interpretation of Bible commentary for teaching and preaching. I don't sell or endorse any product by anyone. I'm just going to read you a quote. This is Elizabeth Achtemeyer. I pray I said her name right. And the commentary on Malachi and this passage. I love what she says. Bless this woman. I'm telling you. She says, it's not a tit-for-tat arrangement, not a vending machine concept of God, not a bargain by which Judah makes an investment and receives a reward in return. Do you know how tired I get of people saying, invest into the kingdom of God? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> now, Jesus said real plainly, you are to store up your treasures in heaven. But I don't need some concept of I'm investing, like perhaps like the stock market, there's risk. With God, there is no risk. Get that straight, and you've got at least 75% of the problem solved. There is no risk with God. But it's not for a tit for tat arrangement, not a vending machine concept of God, not a bargain by which Judah makes an investment and receives a reward in return. To find in this passage any such legalistic, or automatic or materialistic understanding is a complete distortion of the covenant relationship with our God. Man, I love this woman. See, I get tired of this. I get, I get exhausted. Yes, I get weary. That's just like those people telling God. I get weary of watching God's word be prostituted, all because somebody needs to keep their ministry going and feed the machine. Listen, if God can't stir up the giver in you today, you maybe you don't have the Spirit of God. I can't place it in you, and I'm certainly not going to mandate people to, come on, come on, give! <laughs> if you need that, probably need to start back at the beginning with those words to return. I'm telling you, the heart that has been touched 
and operated on by God. And God is the great physician. When he comes in and he does open heart surgery, man, you can believe one thing. He takes out all the stuff that you and I have collected over the years, and he doesn't sew you back up, leaving you with stitches and things hanging. He closes it up, and it's a heart that's been healed. And the process, the beginning point of Christianity is after that heart has been operated on the ability can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, walking with him in his presence, I don't think, well, this is mine and that's yours. God, whatever I have is yours. You graciously bestow it on me. In my gratitude that you'd even give me something, and I think that mindset brings on the reality that God says, well, maybe she's not with me for my blessings after all. So I'm going to pour it out on her. That's what I really think. Too much of the church world chasing after a blessing. It's not even theirs to claim because they're not even his. Yeah. Well, oh, well, wait a minute. Don't, don't you think that's judgmental? Nope. It's not. The reality is, you can't get people. I don't care what type of prayer you want to make them pray down at the altar here and try and make them recognize. Unless the heart is open, no words saying, I'm a sinner and I know I'm a sinner, are going to make this heart change. The mouth, the tongue is deceptive. The heart, when God fixes it, I don't need to tell you, and you don't need to tell me. I know what kind of a person I am, a sinner. And I don't need to pray at once. I say every day, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, knowing it's only by his grace that I'm saved. Now, for the rest of this, this is good. I have to read this to you. There's a true story of a man in Dade County, Florida, who sued his church for the return of the money which he had contributed to it. I delivered $800 of my savings to the church, the man said in his court suit, in response to the pastor's promise that blessings, benefits, and rewards would come to the person who did tithe 10% of his wealth. <clears throat> I told you. I did not, and I have not received these benefits. That crude bargain is not what is involved here when Judah is admonished to bring the full tithe. Motivating and accompanying all true gifts to God is the pouring out of our life, our love, our all. So when, so when we so present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, it is surely true that heaven's richest bounties are heaped upon us. Heaven's windows Swinging upon love's hinges. That's a quote out of G. Campbell Morgan that she's quoting right here. We find ourselves given graces anew every morning, too numerous to count, the glories of a good creation, joy in daily work, patience, kindness, self-control, and, and in the fellowship we have with one another, release from guilt and anxiety, the dread of death, because for the believer there is no dread in that, absent from this crock of clay present with the Lord, and if, if that's not your mindset, you need to go back and read those passages that are promised to the believers in Christ. And above all, peace with God, who winds us around and around with mercy as if with air. The kingdom's goal, the glory of God, becomes our chief occupation when we find all these other things added to us as well. As G. Campbell Morgan once preached, quote, when men come and say, here we are, our interests, ourselves, our business, everything, the windows of heaven are never shut up. Never. The problem with the people in Malachi's day, same problem today. The promises in this book are ours to claim. God's still saying the same message. I've loved you, and I still do. In spite of your failures, in spite of your failures and mine, I still love you. Just quit putting me on trial because it's not going your way. Don't think that it's not my way. God says again, 
Every single one of these, I only covered six, I left one out, which is the closing one, the last one, the last words where they say, your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yeah, you say, what have we spoken against thee? That's the seventh one, just so you can know. I told you all seven. And it still shows you they still didn't get that change of mind. Now, you want to know the sum total of this. God, who knows the heart, looks down. And if you'll read the last few uh, verses of chapter 3, you'll see what I'm saying. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. The Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him, for them that feared the Lord, that thought upon his name, the book of life. The book of life, the very same book of life that's spoken of so many times over, says here, those that, that spoke often to one another, and this is with direct response to having the right attitude, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, that reverenced him, and that thought upon his name, and this is the promise. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, my prized possessions, the ones that I have bought, the ones that didn't look like anything, but I made them into something. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth not. And I, I just tell you today, as the sum total of my message, God who sees the heart knows when we are worshiping him. It's not all these outward signs and all the entertainment and all the exteriors and the fluff. God knows what's going on in our hearts. God knows the struggles. Sometimes even the, the inability to express ourselves in prayer and in worship. He knows about that. And I'm telling you one thing. He sees the manner and means which we offer our offerings. This book speaks preeminently of how we are to approach God, beginning with the heart, and everything that we bring before him, beginning with ourselves, Romans 12, which was just quoted by this commentator, and everything else. That there should not be a mindset that says, wait a minute, I'm not going to take this correction. Not from God and not from Pastor Scott, not from anybody else. Well, whoa! Maybe you're going to be like these people and never come to the recognition that you have a problem. Not God. You. And God can still work those problems out, but the one thing that he needs to have happen is the attitude and I hate to use catchphrases. It drives me nuts when people do this, but there should be an attitude of gratitude. Please don't say that I said that. <laughs> Which cannot be brought on. You, can't, you cannot coerce someone to be grateful. You either recognize the creator, the rescuer, the deliverer. You either recognize the giver of gifts. It is our human tendency to fail to recognize the creator, the giver, the bestower, and immediately graft ourselves to the tangible and say, well, it's ours, it's mine. Creature, possession, it's mine. So I bring this to a close by telling you, even a man like David, in his whole uh, history given to us, he gives a good capstone to close this message with. It's at the very close of 2 Samuel where we find David who is uh, being essentially the, the camp, and David's people are being punished for a census taken on the people, and David must make an offering. And a man, Araniah, Arona, depending on which version you're reading, says, here, I'll give, you, I'll give you the oxen, I'll give you the implements to sacrifice. Here's the threshing floor. Take it all and make the offering. And David says, I'll pay you for it. I must pay you for it because it can't offer anything to God. The scripture says that doth not cost me. In other words, anything, even in this respect, anything we bring to God, you want to bring something? It should cost you something. This was the wake-up call to these people in Malachi's day. Wake up now. Is it going to take you losing everything to come back to worship the Creator? Or will you do your part, turn back to God, 
bring to him what belongs to him, which, by the way, isn't a tenth. I hate to tell you that. Some folks get so hung up on it with the tithe, the tithe. Well, go back and read the Old Testament because the tithe represents approximately somewhere between 25 and 33% of the people's total earnings for the year. Some people say, oh, the tithe. Well, you'd be happy that somebody's telling you about 10% if you're starting out because most people don't understand. There were second, third tithes. There was many different offerings to be offered, but the main ingredient that needs to be underneath it all, whether you're bringing a tithe or an offering, is that the heart be right with God, that in the manner and means in which you present your gift, God is looking on the heart. I cannot see it, but he can. So the message from Malachi is God still loves us and puts up, puts up with so much of what we call offering and worship. It's time to roll up the sleeves and for some of us to get back to the basics and get busy in doing what God has called us to do. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.